Coming up on Oakdale Update, we'll talk with Police Chief Bill Sullivan about his career in law enforcement. And we'll hear about some upcoming events in the city. Stay tuned, Oakdale Update is straight ahead. Welcome to Oakdale Update. I'm your host, Frank Arcello. This is the City of Oakdale's news and information program about your community. Bill Sullivan has been the police chief in Oakdale since 1988. He's here with me today to talk about his career in law enforcement. Bill Sullivan, thank you for joining us on Oakdale Update. Thank you, Frank, for having me. You know, it's, uh, it seems, I see that, you know, you were only here since 88, but Seems like you've been here forever. Yeah, that is forever. <laughs> it? How many years you got in in Oakdale? Well, I'm I'm in year 31 right now. Honest to God, yeah. Yes. That's just Oakdale. That's not counting your that's other. That's just one. Oakdale. But yes. we'll get into that too. But okay, yeah. Tell me a little bit about your background. Give me a little background. Um, I was born and raised in Iowa. Um, ended up leaving school early. I did. <laughs> yeah, which was more common in those days. <laughs> yes. I went in the army. And uh, as a result of going in the Army, they asked what I wanted to do. I had no idea, and they decided I should be an MP, mm -hmm. military police. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got connected to law enforcement. I hadn't even thought about it before mm -hmm. that. I got out of the service, went back to Iowa, worked in law enforcement there, and ultimately ended up coming up here for this job. Okay, so did you, you had a degree in uh, law enforcement from? Yes, where, in Iowa. Iowa. I, yep. Oh, in Iowa. In Iowa, did. yeah. And then what I did is I continued going to school after I got here. And, and got additional degrees. You did. Okay, but uh, you, uh, you're you married and living in Oakdale here, right? Married and living in Oakdale, yes. Uh, we had two sons, uh, nine grandchildren do now. You really? Yeah. With yes, we do. Two sons. That's yes. pretty good. That is. That's <laughs> very good. I got 11. I only got two kids, too, and I had 11. But anyway, um, uh, and you live in Oakdale. Are you concerned about your safety at all, be living in Oakdale? I mean, did no. anybody ever? No. You know what? I never, I've never had a concern about that. I think in many ways, you could have some things you'd be concerned about from time to time, but in many ways, being part of the community is actually the safest thing to do. And you are. And you know people. You know, yeah, right. You're very well. Okay, so uh, so uh, you were a policeman down in Iowa? In Iowa, Just yep. a regular patrolman, yep, right? Yep, I went through uh, the, the normal transition in policing, uh, ultimately decided that we wanted to get to a metropolitan area like this, and, and one day we saw the job advertised for Oakdale, my wife and I did, uh, decided to take a crack at it. We were lucky enough to get it mm -hmm. and uh, been here ever since. It's been How a many other thing. places did you apply to or didn't you? Oh yeah, there were other places that I had applied to over the years. Um, and, and usually you're over applying a little bit higher sure. than you probably should. Sure. Uh, but in this particular case, they had a consultant doing it. Uh, we came up here, we liked the community. When we met the council and, and the city staff, we knew it was going to be a really good fit. Mm -hmm. And that's how it all happened. Okay, so getting to that, um, um, the uh, council people, who were the council people in, in oh, those days? Oh, goodness. Um, who was the, mayor? Who was the mayor? The mayor was Leo Hudala. It was. Hudala. At the time. And on the council was Ted Berth and Bev Peterson. Pat Morris and Marv Merle. Marv Merle. Were the, yes, they were all on there at the time, and uh, they just they made a great impression on us, and and were just so supportive. Who was um, the city administrator? Um, Craig Matson was for yeah. a, a short period of time, yeah. and then he left after that, and and there have been a few in between, you know. But yes. um, no, it's all it's been a very good, very very good opportunity for me and my family. So, go to speaking of administrators, then you worked with Craig Waldron. Oh yes, for 20 years we worked together. Yeah. yeah. It, it, he was a wonderful person. He, he was, was right? yeah, absolutely fantastic. He's over in a similar kind of role in North St. Paul now. Sure. As you well know, sure. in a 
kind of a part-time sort of basis, but yeah, he was a terrific person to work for. He really was. And I'm hearing rumors that he gets more done over there in his part-time work than, the, than has been done in years. I, yeah, that I couldn't tell you. You'd know that yeah, better I know than that. I would. I know that, <laughs> yes, I'm still in touch with it. So, um, okay, so uh, when you okay when you were working down in Iowa, was it just a, a small town or, or as a community? Yeah, I worked in smaller communities, and I had a chief's job in Emmitsburg, Iowa, was the last job I had in Iowa before I came here. And it's a small rural community, and so you did everything, you know, one of those kind of situations. And that's why we knew that it was it was time for us to move toward an urban area. Uh, it was something that we were more interested in. So applied from there, came up here, and like I said, been here ever since. Mm -hmm. What uh, what were some of the other places you applied to? You know, size wise and that kind of thing. Well, over the years, there have been a number of different uh, communities that I've applied in, and and. Uh, usually, if you don't become part of a public process there, you don't really discuss those mm -hmm. at length. Mm -hmm. uh, but there have been opportunities in the Twin Cities that we've looked at in the past and some opportunities out of state as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the end, here we are. So. Yeah. Hey, you know, when you moved here in 88, uh, this was still pretty rural country here. I mean, a lot of farm fields and uh, yeah. cows and all kinds of things. So, yeah. uh, so obviously, how are things, uh, cha things changed? in this in that period oh it's well the community's more than doubled in size uh, for all intents and purposes it's built out uh, yes. you know it, there's there's going to be some growth but it'll it's pretty well done uh, demographically the change is huge uh, you know in 1988 the community was predominantly white yes and uh, the community is no longer that way um, so I think that there's been a lot of good changes a lot of very positive kinds of things uh, the city's adapted very well to those changes, not mm -hmm. just the police department, but the mm -hmm. city in general. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, there's been it's been a huge change. Yeah, and you're staying on top of it, hopefully. We do. I think that we have, what we pride ourselves on is the relationship with the community. Uh, we, you know, we're trying to stay on the front end of things, so you're not dealing with one another just during a crisis. And so in our in our particular case, we have a lot of good uh, outreach, a lot of good relationships with people in the community, and I think that helps make us successful. Mm -hmm. So I'll bring this up, uh, John Larson and uh, the sex trafficking business. Yes. Want to tell us a little bit about that and what your role in that is? Yes, John. Uh, and John I'm saying Larson's, this because this is tied up with the community, right? I mean, right, John, exactly. John yes, thing. yes. John and his group of folks have been really, really active in trying to educate and make people aware of problems with sex trafficking. In our particular case, we have one of our detectives is actually assigned to a countywide task force that deals with it, and it's it's staggering the amount of yeah. work that they have, yeah. uh, and it goes beyond the county obviously because it you know <coughs> you, uh, in a metro area like this everything spreads out everywhere, mm -hmm. but we've we have committed a person to it. The council's been very supportive of that because it's a that's a large financial commitment mm -hmm. also. Um, but it's a big problem and, and one that we continue to work on. But the relationship with John has been has been excellent. It's and that group, the whole group. There, the right? whole group, the you whole bet. Group. And then let's take it further. Pete Orput and his people. They're the best. They, we have a really good working relationship. And in a lot of places, you'll see lots of complaining between the police and the prosecutors really? about who's doing what or who isn't doing what. And in our particular case here, Pete was instrumental in getting the task force up and running and has been supportive of the police departments in Washington County mm -hmm. uh, really since he took over as county attorney. So let's take that a step further. So it's you, or Oakdale, uh, Woodbury, right. Maplewood, and no. North St. Paul, and who else? No, it's for on the, on the task force yes. itself, the sex trafficking task force, it's us, Woodbury, the sheriff's office, the county attorney's office and the Department of Homeland Security. Oh, I thought it was uh, North St. Paul, aren't they? No, they're not. They're not part of this specific oh, task force. Okay. Uh, there are other groups that are operating, and they may well be part of one of those. Okay. Okay. So, if there's a arrest or anything, in, in, are there? I thought I read in the paper there was a bust in North St. Paul, though, wasn't there? Oh, I'm sure there probably was at oh, some point okay. in time. Yeah. Okay. It wouldn't necessarily be with this. It wouldn't necessarily be with our oh, okay. group. Yeah. All right. Okay, good. All right, so uh, let's talk about uh, some of the changes you've seen in law enforcement. And I'm going to 
refer to a, a book written many years ago, uh, Murder in White Bear. Mm. And it was about a, a little boy that got killed by his stepmother. And, um, uh, but I just remember the, the policeman, the, the cops that came, it was after the Korean War or something, and they, one of the guys, he was looking for a job. Somebody says, hey, I hear they're hiring down at the uh, police department. So he went down there, raised his right hand, they gave him a 38 pistol, and he was a cop. Right. Now, how have things changed? Oh goodness! I mean, <laughs> from there, and and, yeah, and yes, again, yeah. the, the, okay, go ahead. So, how have no. things changed? Oh, the uh, here's what I would say about policing today. I think that <coughs> America has never had better police officers. Uh, they're more well educated. They're more well trained. They're better equipped. I think one of the things we may not be quite as good at is the actual interaction with people. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's only because we police a different way now. Uh, you're in a car, a lot of it's with technology, that sure. sort of thing. You're not out the old beat cop kind sure. of thing. I think those folks probably did a better job of developing individual relationships. Uh, but given the environment we're in now, the way we actually work, at American policing's never been better. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's just extraordinary. And investigating is, oh. is way, way ahead. It's, yes, we have, uh, the, the training that the officers receive now is so superior to what we used to do uh, when I first started in this profession. And, and I had told you, that's how I became an MP. Mm -hmm. When I went into the recruiter's mm -hmm. office, they said, God, you're big, you want to be a military <laughs> police yeah. officer? That's the way policing was sure. done then. You know? that's right. But uh, it's not that way anymore, sure. no. You know, my good friend, Eric Roschke, you know, I followed his career. He's a good friend of mine. And I followed his career. And he's telling me about going up to Camp Ripley, shooting and, and, and classes. And, and there's always something going on. And that was just the Highway Patrol. But I'm right. assuming that your people are doing the same thing. We do all the same things. The one thing I will say that, that the community needs to um, understand, too, though, is there, the training is far superior. A lot more of it is mandated. And although the training is a, is a very good, positive thing, those mandates bring a cost with them. So if you have officers that are required to attend a certain kind of training because the state legislature said you had to, uh, you have to pay them to go, you have to pay somebody to work in their place. There are lots and lots of different mm -hmm. uh, direct and indirect costs mm -hmm. related. Sometimes I think we might be getting to the point that we're almost spending too much time mm -hmm. uh, on training and not enough time on actually policing. Sure. Um, but it's better that than the other way that it used sure. to be. But you know, when you have an emergency, uh, or, you know, a police call, it seems like, and I'm just reading things in the paper, uh, within three minutes the police are there, or yeah. five minutes, yeah. or two, or ten, or whatever. Um, so that's, and, they're, and once they're there, they know what they're doing. Yeah. So address that a little bit. I, I think that they do. I think that we're, um, I think the police are very good um, at addressing community needs rapidly and efficiently. The one thing that I would say that I, I would like folks to remember though is that we still have human beings doing mm -hmm. this job. Mm -hmm. And so what ends up happening sometimes is we, we make mistakes, sometimes they're horrible mistakes, but rarely are they ever intentional. And so we always would ask that the community step back and understand that real people are doing this job sure. and, and they're not going to be perfect at it. Sure. And doing it under sometimes extraordinarily difficult circumstances. But I think uh, it, there's never been a time that you are in a better position to get a qualified, competent police officer than you are today. Mm -hmm. So what does it take to become a police? I mean, I'm starting out a high school or college kid, college grad or whatever. What does he first have to do? What, what happens? Well, in Minnesota, there, Minnesota's unique in that there's an educational requirement, a two-year degree requirement, mm -hmm. and there's a core curriculum that they go through. And then after that, you go to what's called skills. It's like the academy. Uh, you have to pass a post exam, which is a state licensing exam. And then you have to find somebody that ends up hiring you. Mm -hmm. So there are multiple steps that you end up going through, uh, particularly in Minnesota, to get a job. I think that's a very positive thing because it, it brings you quality people, but it is it is a big commitment sure. on the front end for people. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a shortage of policemen right now? Yes, in, in the United States in general, let me say that. It's getting more and more difficult to recruit people into the field. Mm -hmm. uh, larger departments, it's not uncommon for them to be short hundreds of, of positions. Yeah. 
yeah. uh, because it's very difficult to get people to, and, and not just because of uh, <laughs> some of the problems that we've seen recently, but because of the work schedule and holidays and you know all those other kind of things. A lot of folks don't want to do that anymore. Now, that's an interesting point because that carries over into industry or anything else too. Uh -huh. Young people, as a general rule, today don't want to make commitments that are off the off the chart a little bit. Right. I mean, and I think that's fair to say. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we, we see the same thing that you, you know, if, you, if you're looking at policing as an occupation, say, okay, for the first few years I'm going to work midnights, I'm going to work on weekends, sure. I'm going to work on holidays. A lot of younger folks aren't going to want to do that anymore. They don't want to do it anymore. Right. Yeah, things have changed there, huh, Bill? Okay, so tell me some of the highlights of working in Oakdale in particular. You know. Highlights of working in Oakdale. I tell you what we think, what we take, the, I think, the greatest pride in. Over the years, We've had some recognition. We've received a couple of awards for innovation and in policing, you know, that sort of thing. And we're very proud of those things. But more importantly to us is that we've got this long-term, uh, very successful relationship with the community as a whole. So I, I've, never, I've never felt in Oakdale that we were somehow the enemy, Sure. that we were the problem in the community. And I think there are some communities that are like that. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's the the greatest satisfaction that we get, that's what we think is um, our most significant accomplishment is to keep that going mm -hmm. over an extended period of time and that's very hard to do. Mm -hmm. Now, you worked very well with the council and the mayor and yes. the mayors over the years, uh, you know, all of them, you've worked really We're well lucky. with them. Yes. And the police department has worked well with them. Yes. Do you, do you ever, did you ever see any problems with the, the council and you, your, your department? No, I tell you, we, um, the council, over this 31 plus years, the councils that we've had here have been extraordinarily supportive of law enforcement, not blindly so. Uh, there, it's not uncommon for me to have to explain something we did or sure. something that we want to purchase or whatever, and that's appropriate. Uh, that, that's clearly their role, but we've had tremendous uh, success. We're currently going through something right now. We're going to be expanding the facility, and that's a very expensive process. And the council well, you're talking about the building, the building, building? yeah. Yes. And the council recognizes that. And those are tough political decisions, but they have been on board from the beginning with it. They are supporting it, and uh, we you know, we've found that all all along throughout the years. Mm -hmm. We've been really lucky. Okay. So speaking of this uh, uh, expansion, what what are you doing and why? Oh, we're going to, for one thing, we're going to finally have indoor parking. <laughs> That's a really? huge issue. We've never, we've never had it here. Uh, and and I, I know it sounds like an incredible convenience or luxury, but it's related to the equipment now. Uh, the cars are so technologically oriented sure. with computers and all the other things in there, they can't sit out in the parking lots for hours at a time when it's 40 below zero. Mm -hmm. And so we've, we find we're going to add uh, indoor parking space, a little bit more office and storage space and a training component to the really? building. Uh, we'll have a room where we can do our defensive tactics work, uh, that we can do simulation training with computers and like shoot, don't shoot kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, council's been very supportive of, of the whole plan so mm -hmm. far. We're thinking if everything works out right, we'll actually start construction in probably in early 2020. Really? Mm -hmm. It's coming up. Uh, it sounds like a pretty big area that you're taking. What, how, how much of it? It is. is it's it's going to about double the size of the space that the PD has right now. Uh, but they've configured it in a way that we were able to stay on site. One of the things that I really wanted to do is it was important to me uh, to stay at the city hall complex if sure. we could. Folks come in and they've got a number of different things they want to do at the city. We don't want to have them running all over the place sure. to, to different locations. But we were concerned about Walton Park and how much space it would take. Well, the architects came up with a configuration that really minimizes the impact on the park mm -hmm. and I think will work really well for us. That sounds really good. So speaking of, um, uh, what is your ties to the Homeland Security and the FBI or anything else? How, when do you use them? When, or when do you... Uh, Go to them. I guess. If you, we will go to them uh, when there are, as an example, uh, bank robberies. The FBI does, uh, so our officers will respond, obviously, assist in the investigation. But primary responsibility goes to the FBI. If you had situations that involve, for example, terrorism, uh, you would involve FBI, Homeland Security. Um, so their their resources are always available to us. 
they have representatives that come to our chiefs meetings and all that other oh, sort of thing. Oh yeah, they're they're uh, very much engaged. Uh, I think with local policing, and so to the extent that we need them and the resources that they have, they're available to us. Mm -hmm. um, so speaking of that, what is the crime rate in Oakdale? How, where is it? You know, are we on top, below, medium, or no? Right? I think that you're gonna. I, I think a person would find that the crime rate in Oakdale remains predominantly property crime, which is typical of a suburb. Mm -hmm. Uh, given our proximity to Minneapolis and St. Paul, we have very low levels of violent crime. Mm -hmm. um, most of the violence that we see is not random, which is a good thing. You bet. Uh, most of it will be related to domestic kind of situations, that sort of thing. So it's a very safe community. Uh, I've never felt uncomfortable here, living here, my family being here, anything at all. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been very fortunate that way as well. You know, you speak of bank robbers, I can't remember it's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember any. It's been a while. We we <laughs> had one uh, earlier this year at U.S. Bank, um, and it was a demand note kind of situation. Uh, you know, you'll have one every couple of years kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That's good. You mm -hmm. don't need a lot of volume. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so speaking of that, do you, uh, do you personally or does your department have classes for bankers, you know, and tell them how to oh, yeah. protect and that kind of thing? Yeah, absolutely. We, we participate in all those kind of things at their request. Uh, the banks also have excellent internal staffs that tend to do a lot of their training to prepare them for robberies and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. But we're always available for that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So taking a step further, you're available too for uh, old people and for, Absolutely. for uh, crimes, you know, uh, scams and that oh, kind of thing. Oh, goodness. We, and we that's actually, getting to be a big thing too. Is that part of your department? Are you oh, yes, on that? yes it is. In fact, we had um, Michelle Stark and Ryan Stewart from our community affairs group at that time uh, actually put together a booklet that got mailed out to every residence in the community. Mm -hmm. And the reason that we did that was we were having so many reports of different kinds of financial scams sure. that we wanted to alert people to some of the most common ones. So they did some research, put together a terrific booklet that we still use and still distribute and, and did the first one, we did a mailing to everybody. Mm -hmm. And then we distribute them at financial institutions and grocery stores and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's a lot of that. That's one of the more common kind of crimes. And now. you know, and I just can't imagine why anybody in this day and age would fall for something like that. It's hard to, I yeah. mean, I got home one time and on my answering machine, I had two calls from Social Security that I owe them money and one call right. from IRS that I owe them money. Right. I mean, and it just, you know, here's a phone number, call this number. It's nonstop. It's yeah. unbelievable. Yeah, it so, is. but I'm, uh, if it's a crime of, they must be rewarded, they must be making money doing it, so yes. So what more can you do? Because they, what happens, is, for me, I think the best approach is the educational one, which is why we did the mailing on the booklet, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, many older people uh, have a tendency to believe whoever they happen to be talking to at the moment, especially if it's presented as a, uh, an authority or a crisis of some sure, sort. We, sure. Your grandson needs help. Yes. I'm from the Internal Revenue. <coughs> I'm from some other government yeah. agency. And so if we can educate people well enough to understand these are, are in all likelihood scams and to do nothing until you call somebody that whose advice you trust, yeah. whether that's police or family or whoever it might be, yeah. I, I think is, is our best hope for that. Okay, so if uh, I get a call, I'm an elderly person now, I guess, and uh, if I get a call about from IRS and I call you, would I call the police department, what would you do, what would you do about it? What can you do about it? Well, what we can do is uh, sometimes there are opportunities to track where the calls came from, where the email came from, whether there's a pattern to the offense. Uh, there may be suspects and other crimes similar to it already. Uh, or at least be gathering the information so we can develop that in the future, mm -hmm. those kind of patterns mm -hmm. and things. So we really encourage uh, people to give us a call and, and we may or may not be able to figure out immediately who it is that called you, mm -hmm. uh, but it may contribute toward the greater good. Mm -hmm. Probably uh, they pretty well cover their tracks, don't they? I mean, it, Oh, it can, be, it can be very difficult, yeah. Yeah, yeah they're run through different servers and phones and and they're ghosting phone numbers and they're doing yeah. all kinds of different things. So it's gonna be problematic and that's why education's the most important. Absolutely. The IRS isn't gonna call you at home. Yeah. They're not gonna do that. And so. you, it's your, up to you to stop it at, right. at the start exactly. if, you can, if yep. you can. But I have to tell you, I, I, in my business, of course, I'm dealing with people all day. And I, I hear stories quite often about educated people who fall for oh, this. Yeah. I just can't, I mean. Yeah, 
Yep. Very costly. Very it's costly. very costly. And you know, the, the most important thing is to remember that you're never going to get rich quick. Yeah. And if it sounds like that, it's probably phony. And yeah. so you need to make sure you contact yeah, us. Absolutely. Um, okay, Bill, so we're almost out of time here. Um, so what does the future hold for you personally? You got 30 some years in. Mm -hmm. uh, you could get, you could pull the plug any time now. Right. And, but you and I, we're a couple of old horses here. We've oh, been in guys. the community for an <laughs> awful long time. Right. Uh, so what do we want? Should I retire when you retire? Or Let's, we might as well just do it together. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what, is your, what are your plans? Um, I really love what I'm doing yet. I think we have a, we have a great department. Uh, we have a really, I, th I hope the, the community realizes how lucky they are with the staff. Sure. They have at City Hall. Yes. There's a very experienced group of people, and, and, and I, I'm really proud to be a part of that. Uh, so as long as I keep enjoying it, I'll keep doing it. I'm certainly going to want to see the building project through. Oh, good for you. Um, but and then decide after that at, at some point in time, like Joe Mauer. You know? <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah. So you're not under obligation to retire. You know, do you no. have to retire after no. so many years? No, 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 years? no. I'm. I can keep going. I could beat you. Go oh. forever. <laughs> well, you got a few years younger. We than do me, so. exactly. Well, uh, so we'll just wait till your hair turns gray and. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I beat you. <laughs> we don't have to worry about That's that right. anymore. Well, Chief Sullivan, I just appreciate you coming on our show and appreciate you being our chief and staying with us for so long. Thank you. I mean, without you, I mean, our police force is just wonderful. I never heard, any, never heard anything bad about it. And you get along good with everybody. And we don't have any little nitpicky, icky stuff in the newspapers, lucky. right? Yep. Everybody gets fortunate. along at City Hall just fine. And I say that, I say that to every time I'm interviewing anybody from the city, right. how lucky we are that, oh. as you said, the, the, uh, the fabric up there is just wonderful. It's really good. No yeah. turnovers and yeah. no backstabbings. And no. no, it's been fantastic, but thank you. You I bet. sure appreciate that. My friend, thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome. Okay. We're just about out of time, but here's a few important reminders. All Family Dental at 1075 Hadley Avenue will buy unwanted Halloween candy. They, in turn, will send it to persons serving in the military as part of Operation Gratitude. Last year, All Family Dental collected over 100 pounds of candy. Please drop candy off by November 9th. Here's a winter parking reminder. No on-street parking from November 1st to April 1st between the hours of midnight and 5 a.m. Also, no on-street parking anytime there is a measurable snowfall until the street is plowed curb to curb. There will be an art fair at the Discovery Center on November 3rd. Hours are 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. And Oakdale's popular indoor market will return on November 10th at the Discovery Center located at 4444 Hadley Avenue. Over 20 vendors will be there selling sweets, cheeses, meats, essential oils, and more. Hours are 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. That's all we have time for this month on Oakdale Update. For everyone at the City of Oakdale, thanks for watching.